J.T. Crowley is talking books. On this show, you'll hear from emerging talent and seasoned veterans from around the world. Hello, I'm J.T. Crowley, and I'm delighted to have on my show today Dr. James G. Martin, former U.S. Congressman and State Governor of North Carolina, to talk about his book, Revelation Through Science about the evolution in the harmony of science and religion. Dr. Martin spent 26 years in public life, but when you strip away that life and look at some of the other things he has accomplished, you'd be hard pressed to say that he's led a dull existence. He is a Princeton PhD organist, organic chemist, not an organist, everybody, an organic chemist, who taught at prestigious Davidson College, his alma mater. He served as vice president of medical research at Carolina's Medical Center in Charlotte. And if you want to know everybody why his webpage is designated beatenpathbooks.com, then go to his webpage and you'll find out why. So this is a gentleman, everybody, who has been to, you know, he's a Princeton PhD organic chemist, and he's been at the prestigious Davison College, as well as being uh, currently an author and former US Congressman and state governor for North Carolina. Well, Dr. Martin, I think it's fair enough uh, to say you've had a full life and you're definitely not off the beaten path. (laughs) Well, thank you, John. It's good to be with you on this. And I'm glad we had a few moments just to get acquainted because that always works better for me. And I I expect it does for you too, to sort of get the measure of each other. And no, I was not an organist. I played tuba in the Charlotte Symphony. I know. So I am a musician. (laughs) (laughs) That's what you call everybody is a tongue-tied twist, you know. The teeth weren't going at the same pace as the brain. (laughs) (laughs) Organic chemist, everybody. Um, Dr. James, would you care to tell the listeners more about yourself and why you felt compelled to write this very, very fascinating book? Well, John, I I grew up in a, a, a very religious household. My father was a minister, and more important, my mother was a minister's wife. And so we boys uh, knew where to be on Sunday morning and all that. So I had a good grounding in that. At Davidson, we had to take courses in religion at that time. And uh, yet when I got to graduate school, I began to realize that uh, not everyone agreed with me on that, that there were, were a number of people, particularly in the sciences, who were atheists and they made their arguments, and I like to listen to people's arguments, especially when they're contrary to mine. And and yet I, I wasn't persuaded because there was something gnawing in the back of my head about things we learned in organic chemistry uh, of th- that would be uh, far too coincidental uh, for us to be here without some guidance being involved. Well, that that idea festered for a while, and. Later, I started giving some lectures on that, and before long, I decided I would write a book. There had been books by astronomers, physicists, biologists, geologists, philosophers, theologians, atheists, but none by an organic chemist. And so that's where revelation through science came about. I like the the first word. It is revelation, in my view, that science reveals to us that God is. Not, but not who God is. Now, uh, my my view is I can't tell you what to believe about that. You have to decide that for yourself. And so throughout the book, it takes a lot of, of work to be sure that while I don't tell you what to think, I do give you a lot to think about. You know, when I no look test at the end of the day, when I look at the book, that comes across very strongly indeed. And if you're very uh, astute, everybody, you will notice that uh, Dr. James emphasizes organic chemist, not organ organist. 
I think he was having a little joke with me there. <laughs> um, what I love about your book, Dr. James, is the immense length uh, you go to to get your observational points across, you know, your rational arguments, as you take the educated non-scientists on an evolutionary journey of the major scientific disciplines of astronomy, physics, chemistry, biology, and paleontology, with harmony to the world's great religions and their religious concepts of creation. A Big Bang Theory. Hmm. Do you think um, religion and science views are getting closer to the question of how life started and are they becoming more compatible? So my question to you is, do you think this and how would you substantiate this? No, John, it's, it's certainly true that with regard to Darwin's theory of evolution, uh, most religious groups have uh, come to accept that. Uh, certainly questions at the beginning, and those questions were made more difficult because of some sociological interpretations of evolution, eugenics, war, uh, and so forth. And, uh, and, and yet that's becoming more accepted. And all of these fields help to show how that could happen, and in a way that it's not in conflict with a theistic belief in God, uh, but rather, we many of us are coming to understand that evolution, let's say, is how God did it. Uh, it doesn't tell us how the first life got started. That's called abiogenesis, the genesis of life with nothing except random chemicals. Uh, that's a different question. We're not getting close on that. And, uh, and so I try to go through that, but also... Uh, in addition to the Big Bang, which for the first time uh, provides some scientific uh, support, coincidence, you might say, with Genesis 1 in the beginning. For a long time, astronomers were of the belief and taught that the, the world, the, the universe did not begin. It was from everlasting to everlasting, to use a, a, a biblical phrase, uh, and that it, uh, it had no beginning. It's just always been there. And that's where the work by Edwin Hubble, uh, an astronomer, another astronomer, Vesta Slifer, combined their data to show that the universe was expanding, and therefore it had to start, and it was expanding at a rate that the further apart they were, the faster apart they were moving. Uh, back when the Bible was written, there was no way to observe that. They didn't know anything about galaxies. They had no telescopes. Uh, they had no spectrometers. They had no calculators. Uh, and, and they did the best they could with interpreting what they saw. And that's true in the Old Testament, but as well in all other religions. It was something that hardly any civilization escaped being aware of, that there was something out there uh, beyond us. But Hubble and Slifer, their work, uh, as as also interpreted by the uh, Danish uh, priest astronomer Edwin Lemaitre, uh, he came up with the idea that it started from a primeval atom. Well, I think that was a mistake because they were measuring distances to galaxies, and I don't know how you can can uh, extrapolate that down to a submicroscopic point. Uh, it'd be like a point in the universe. Our entire solar system would be a point in the universe. Our galaxy would be a point in the universe. And so uh, I, I think that they overdid that, trying to explain how you could get from one atom to 10 to the 90th uh, power atoms. I, um, I think I strayed off your question there a little bit, but the, the point is that uh, not everyone is accepting this yet, and not everyone sees it. And so the purpose of my book is to show you that science is not the enemy of faith. Science does not disprove religion any more than religion, the Bible, 
uh, other texts can disprove science. And, and so in some ways, we're getting closer, but there are still some big questions out there, things that are too remote. I've totaled up about 54 different uh, coincidences or fine-tuning examples uh, that is highly unlikely that uh, all of these could happen just to have us here. But here we are. So there has to be some explanation. I you know when I look at your book, this isn't a bedtime story read, everybody. This is a thought-provoking book. This is a book that is um, going to uh, make you think. Um, it's not a judgmental book, but it certainly will make you think. So what I want to do now, everybody, is I want to go to um, chapter one. Um, here, uh, Dr. James, you talk about the biblical canon, creations in other religions, theological reflections, religious creations, creationists, defending the literal interpretation of the Holy Scriptures, so as to refute uh, scientific arguments. And I was very fascinated to see that you started off by um, saying the Old Testament authors were not scientists and that basic scientific theories really didn't evolve until the third century BC, around by the Council of Nicaea, 325 AD, commissioned by Roman Emperor Constantine. Science does not reveal anything about the essence of God or his purpose for us, nor can it do so. A Big Bang Theory. So in the beginning, Genesis section, you have that section in there. And when you look at that, everybody, it's a very, very interesting section of this chapter. And we also, we touch on uh, Judaism and Islamic accounts having certain similarities, which I found, hmm, that was an interesting viewpoint. So this is a very busy, busy opening, powerful chapter, everybody, packed with stimulations, thinking and theories. So my question to you, Dr. James, is, and so that the listeners can get an understanding of what this chapter is about, did you enjoy setting this chapter out in this fashion? And was it important to you to kickstart the book off in this way? That's an interesting uh, question. Uh, I, I felt to begin with that the first discipline that I should discuss should be religion, the Bible. That's the first book and there are other uh, texts, as you say, in, in other religions. And that's where we start. Then we go into the books that have been written based on all of the scientific technology, the scientific method, and all that it has enabled us to learn. But I wanted to start with this chapter. What does the Bible say? And what? how do we interpret that? The, the first uh, question comes up, when was the beginning? And so there were attempts to try to uh, estimate about when that might have been. There was an Archbishop James Usher, uh, one of your fellow countrymen, who uh, did a remarkable job of adding up the sum of all of the begats in the book of Genesis. And he concluded that it had to be about 4000 BC. And because there was some reason to believe that there was a millennial uh, change uh, at about four years before one of those round numbers, for example, uh, 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 Herod died about the 4 BC, and therefore that would be when the Christ was born. And so he concluded it had to be 4004 BC. And uh, another tried to estimate the time of day and the, and the year. But th this was an important effort. It was all they had to go with. I don't uh, diminish that. Uh, I would say that it's consistent with science to say that the world, the earth, the sun, were created more than at least 6,000 years ago. And we now have evidence based on the progression of the 
galaxies away that it was on the order of almost 14 billion years ago for the universe and four and a half billion years ago for the creation of the earth. We had to wait until a, a, a fortunate supernova blew up to create all of the debris on which we live. It was a long wait. <laughs> yep. If I strayed from your question, bring me back to it. But Oh, no, 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 no. Um, I'm a huge believer in allowing the author to... Because um, you know your book more than I do. And I'm a huge believer in allowing the author to um, deviate. And because for me, that brings a certain degree of... Uh, passion and belief about what you've written so that's why i sit back i don't do I, I don't i don't want to appear to be a deviant and oh, you have to be careful know. when you when you allow that kind of a uh, range of uh, for a politician oh. but anyway we'll proceed go right oh, ahead. And, uh, and, and as a former politician you know all about answering questions and we won't go there everybody <laughs> <laughs> we could be here for a very long time. <laughs> um, we say, John, we say that the way to tell if a politician is lying, the lips move. <laughs> and the art of a politician or former politician is to answer a question by not answering it. And we'll move on very quickly. <laughs> I'll do my best. Um, I found Dr. James, Chapter 4, uh, Revelation Through Astronomy, captivating, to be honest with you, very captivating. Particularly the sections uh, you know, where time began, the Dark Ages, serendipitous echo from the Big Bang, quasars and black holes, carbon isotypes. You talk about the science of astronomy, has come a long way since Braque and Galileo, the Hubble telescope, the Lewell observatory, Hull's decision of Hubble's concepts, inflationary epochs, dark energy, negative gravitivity, quark epochs, electrons, positrons and neutrons, thermonuclear fusion, Lost Chord of Cosmology, 1965. The Big Ear Quasar, Supernovas. There's an awful lot packed in this chapter here. So clearly you see the significance of this chapter to the overall relevance to your book. But my question is this to you. Do you think the educated non-scientist mind will engage with this chapter and see the importance of why you have put this chapter in the book. Um, what conclusions would you substantiate your answer upon? Well, let, let's begin with the approach that I wanted to take to do my best as a former chemistry teacher to explain some difficult material in a way that the educated non-scientist could understand it, but yet in a way that the uh, advanced physicist in this case, or, or other fields, would not be offended by my interpretation. Science is, is based, understanding of science, I should say, is based on the use of metaphor. The concept of the atom is a metaphoric description of based on what we believe to be is at the, the base. And so I try to show that in metaphorical terms. I was fortunate to have a, a son of Dottie and mine, our, our oldest son, Jim Jr., who's a cartoonist. And in working with him, I found that he could see ways, simply way, simple ways to draw things that would be easier for the average reader to, to grasp. And then beyond that, of course, I have to realize that there may be some topic that the reader, uh, you as the reader will say, well, now, wait a minute, I, I don't understand that. And, and I would say, well, then set that aside, move on, maybe come back to it. But if you once get to the point of saying, wow, that looks like a miracle, 
then I've made my point in scientific terms about a theoretical, theological concept. Um, so yes, I think it would be, uh, and I found in speaking to groups that some of the most uh, difficult parts for non-scientists uh, can be understood with pictures, and that's why we have some 70 of those charming, uh, whimsical, often, uh, cartoons to help you to see and imagine what's going on. For example, when we get to talking about proteins, he shows the RNA as a train with the boxcars being the code from a gene going through the protein factory, and he puts little smokestacks on the on the factory. It and does everyone. That yeah. code, that determines which amino acid in order gets built into the new protein. So it's a lot easier to see than to look at the pictures in a biology textbook. Oh, I, I totally agree, because sometimes everybody, when you look at uh, Dr. James's book, says there's lots of these um, drawings, illustrations done by his um, son. And a, a, a drawing can be very, um, you know, it gets the message across very simply and it supports the uh, the text. And these drawings really do strengthen what Dr. James is trying to get across in his message here, everybody. So well done. A lot of things, a lot of things we can see that we don't fully understand. And yet seeing is step one. And so I think that helps. And I put it in words and try to relate that in the book. And so I found that uh, people can always grasp some of it if they can't get all of it. Oh, absolutely. And I will go back to the Bible there when Jesus says, happy are those who believe and yet have not seen. Doubting Thomas, everybody. Yep. Definition of faith. Absolutely. Um, Dr. James, uh, let's uh, move on to the book. It's very clear to me, Dr. James, that you have some very interesting judgments throughout your book. And when I look at chapters seven and nine in part two, everybody, of your book, these well thought out conclusions are very much in evidence. Let's go to chapter seven, which you head up, Charles Darwin. You touch upon the infamous Darwin's theory of evolution. Galapagos Treasures, Domestic Darwin, Alfred Wallace, Herbert Spencer, Francis Galton, and Thomas Henry Huxley, The Evolution of Conflict, Darwin Origin of Species, and how the Catholic Church, in particular, found it hard to relate to Galileo's um, theories, but they could... Um, have some sympathy with Tycho Brake's more modified and acceptable approach to life's evolutionary path. My question is, what do you think, or more to what the educated non-scientist would get out of this chapter? What do you want the reader, the people who will read this chapter get out of it why do you put it in what do you want to get what do you want them to get out of it well first of all it's a charming story there's an earlier biography of galileo who was uh, a very haughty person a very antagonistic to his aristotelian colleagues and here's uh, charles darwin more retiring reticent cautious of uh, had suffered from a series of severe illnesses, lost his daughter, Annie. And so it's a story about someone who shook the meaning of the world. So it has to be in there. And uh, it begins with his voyage on the Beagle and the interpretation and how he comes to that interpretation that apparently he concludes all living beings, all species are somehow descended from similar origins. Uh, he concludes there have to be some changes going on, but he didn't know what caused those changes. And then he concluded 
uh, in, in, in sync uh, with uh, Alfred Russell Wallace, who had been doing some similar exploration in Borneo uh, in, in the Philippines and uh, in that part of the South Pacific. And they separately concluded that nature was somehow selecting the, the versions, the variations that were most suitable for the climate, the available food, reproduction, whatever it might be. And so they finally met each other and uh, put together a program which they had surrogates read for them their, uh, uh, their ideas. And uh, that immediately became controversial, not just with the Catholic Church, but with uh, the uh, Lutherans as well. And in my country today, and in fact, the part of the United States in the Southeast, where I live, uh, there are many people who are fundamentalist uh, in their religions, take the absolute uh, literal interpretation of the Bible, who reject uh, evolution and there is a movement to try to to show that you don't need that and they have a, a, a little uh, museum you can go to where you can see humans frolicking with dinosaurs well dinosaurs were extinguished 60 billion years ago now i don't uh, want to belittle their faith and their basis for it that's up to them i just say but that's not what science says, and don't try to say that it is. So in this chapter, I, I want people to see that here's a very controversial topic that is becoming less controversial because science is being able to overcome some of the, the, the objections. And later, then this sets the stage for organic chemistry and the relationship between DNA, RNA, proteins. All proteins are made on a code taken from a gene of DNA by one RNA molecule going through that protein factory and, and sugars and how those are fundamentally related in a triangular relationship. And so you'll have to read the, the book to see that. But you need first to know what's the problem with evolution. Uh, it's still disputed by some, but I conclude that it was organic chemistry, molecular biology from that showing us what dna looks like what its structure is and the enormous code that it can carry and then i add this three-dimensional asymmetric relationship that all dna and rna are right-handed like uh, the threads of a screw they're not left-handed just like you go to the hardware store you can't buy left-handed screws they're not going to have them in there they have right hand them on. Yeah, you, you might, and, and bolts and nuts, you, you don't want to have right-handed bolts where you could get a hold of some left-handed nuts that won't fit. Anyway, the same is true with DNA and RNA. They are all right-handed, and that's because the backbone is the sugar, which is right-handed, and that's because sugars are made by proteins, which are assembled exclusively by left-handed amino acids. See how I can get going as an organic chemist now? And those Amino acids are selected by RNA, and that's where it gets its asymmetry from. That is a three-dimensional chicken and egg. Which came first, the chicken or the egg? The DNA, the RNA, the, the ribose, the deoxyribose, the, the proteins. I say they all had to be there in the first living species, and the odds of that happening, you decide. Um, that's so we got to start whole, with. That's we the have whole to start with the book, everybody. Start with the foundation build up. Doctor James will put in all sorts of theories, judgments, but it's up to you, the reader, to make your own mind up. Absolutely, He's not going to do that for you. That's the whole concept of the book. It's a thought-provoking book. Let's get to chapter nine. Even like that, absolutely. I said my, yeah. Um, let's go to chapter nine, Doctor James. The scopes. Monkey child. Now, the major area of discussion here, as far as I can see, is Dayton, Tennessee, 1925, when the state legislature passed the Butler Law, which made it unlawful in Tennessee 
to teach any theory that denies the story of divine creation as taught by the Bible, and to teach instead that man descended from a lower order of animals. And so the story is about here, it's about a young teacher, John Thomas Scopes, who was convicted of teaching evolution, violating the Butler's law. My question to you, Dr. James, is would you care to share your own stance around this judgment? Do you think oh, it yes. was fair? John, yep. John Scopes was actually a, a physics teacher substituting for the biologist uh, one day, the absent biologist, and he just told the students, uh, you look in the back of your textbook and there's a chapter there about evolution. Read it for yourself. Was that a violation? Uh, the town folks of Dayton, Tennessee, wanted to get some publicity, so they got him to agree to stand trial on that, and and they brought in uh, Clarence Darrow, a famous uh, in America, a famous lawyer, uh, and William Jennings Bryan, who four times had been the candidate of the Democratic Party for president of the United States, and they had quite. When each of them arrived, they had a big banquet for each one of them. In other words, they made a big show of this thing. It was the first trial in our country that was ever covered by radio. And uh, famous newspaper writers were there. H.L. Uh, Mencken, uh, if you're not familiar with that name, but he's a very sarcastic writer for the Baltimore paper. So it, it was a, a spectacle in many ways. Uh, quite unlike the motion picture Inherit the Wind that was based on it and that featured Spencer Tracy and Frederick March and Gene Kelly as leading actors. And then it was made three more times. Uh, it's been quite a quite a production. But ultimately, did he violate the law? The court found, yes, he did. And it was not the Bible that was on trial as uh, as Brian tried to defend the Bible. The Bible was not on trial as Clarence Darrow tried to attack the Bible. The Bible was not on trial. It was John Thomas Scopes who was on trial. And there was a law, and he did violate it. Now, the problem was, when it went to the state Supreme Court, they threw it out on the grounds that the Constitution also required you could not levy a fine of $100, of more than $50, without the jury authorizing that. And because the law itself, the, this Butler law, specified a $100 fine, the judge just levied the $100 fine. The state Supreme Court said, you violated the Constitution throughout the conviction. Problem with that was it did not get the question to the United States Supreme Court because it had already been thrown out. So we had to wait till years later uh, when Bill Clinton was governor of Arkansas and a similar law was put on trial that we were finally able to get the process to get it to the Supreme Court, which ruled overwhelmingly that it violated the First Amendment, which protects freedom of religion, freedom of speech, freedom of assembly, and so forth. That's a fascinating. It, it's fascinating a wonderful answer. chapter, but it, it's so humorous, too, because yeah. here were a bunch of guys, you say rascals, were having a good time at the drugstore. <laughs> owned by the the chairman of the school board, and they had a willing uh, foil in John Scopes, who also coached uh, football and track, and to, to get this for publicity for the town. There's now a college there, the William Jennings Bryan University, uh, which uh, helps celebrate that uh, great episode. You can go and see it, see the school where all this happened. There you go, everyone. Um, Dr. James, let's move on to part three of the book and look at the chapters 11 and 14. The age of the earth and revelation through organic chemistry, respectively. Chapter 11. Here I see you encouraging the educated non-scientist mind to constructively think about certain understandings around the age of the earth. 
Geologic Time, Relevation in Our Time, her book, and you kickstart the chapter from Shakespeare, which I thought was highly imaginative, and from the, the play As You Like It, 1599. And it's the character Rosalind to, talking to Orlando. And the quote is, the world is almost 6,000 years old. You talk about the universe is 13.8 billion years old and that it was created at once in one profound burst of energy and matter called the Big Bang. This is in stark contrast to the biblical story that God created the world in six days and on the seventh he rested. As someone who sits on both sides of the fence, being a scientist and a person with a substantial religious understanding, do you honestly believe that science and religious ideologies are drawing closer to each other and that this chapter gives the reader some inkling that they are? Of course I do. And, and otherwise I wouldn't have taken so much effort to polish and repolish uh, this chapter. Uh, again, not everyone agrees with this, but there are a growing number of scientists who are publishing books. Uh, one, one of the uh, thought leaders on this, John Polkinghorn from your country, a physicist, and uh, Owen Gingrich, of, uh, an astronomer, at Harvard, Francis Collins, the uh, who headed the Human Genome Project and is now uh, the director, the top scientist in the United States in the National Institutes of Health, a man whom I met twice and twice tried to persuade him to put something in his book about organic chemistry, because as a doctor, he had taken organic chemistry, but he didn't do it, so I had to do it myself. But the, the average or the, the educated non-scientist reader can see here that there were some tools, instruments, ways of thinking and approaching understanding in science that helped us to realize that the earth is a little over four and a half billion years old. And that then is a long enough time to have ages that many of which have been discovered in the geologic record, the fossil record, to correspond to the time that it would take for very slow evolution to take place. One of the first arguments against evolution was, well, if the Earth is only 6,000 years old, it's not long enough to do that. And then a geologist looking at uh, these uh, bursts of, of Earth due to tectonic crushing of the continents and so forth uh, would take a lot longer, and they estimated, well, it had to be 40 or 50 million years old and and argued with Darwin and with T.H. Huxley to that effect. Well, it, it turns out, I know that wouldn't be long enough. But then they started uh, measuring the rate of cooling of large metal spheres that had been heated up. And as that temperature slowly went down, they could measure that, they could plot it out on the graph and try to estimate how long it would take for Earth to cool down to where it is. Uh, they didn't allow for the fact of radioactive fission inside the Earth, uh, adding more heat as we go along. So it's older than that concluded. They came up with, uh, uh, you know, uh, perhaps a, a billion years. And it was only when we had the ab ability to measure radioactive decay that one measurement after another show that not only is Earth four and a half billion years old, but meteorites that strike the Earth are four and a half billion years old. The moon is four and a half billion years old. Uh, someday we'll find out more about Mars and uh, elsewhere. And, and I think that's fascinating for people to see. Uh, in a way, that's complicated science, but in another way, it's just a few little steps reasonably trying to figure out uh, how how long it would take for us to be here, and therefore how old the Earth is. Fascinating answer. Hmm. 
I'm just and it doesn't dispute the Bible. The Bible, the Bible itself does not say the earth is 6,000 years old. That was Usher's interpretation, which got incorporated into that medial margin in the center of the King James Version several hundred years ago. And it says, with Genesis 1, 1, there's a little, a little A. And the A, it says 4004 BC. Well, I have an old copy of the King James Version that says that. I also have a newer copy of the King James Version where they've decided not to include that anymore because the Bible cannot be translated to say that. It's just the adding up the sequence of begets of generations. And of course you referenced... Based on what they knew. Yes. Absolutely. Of course you referenced the King James Version in the book. Yes. Um, I want to move on here, Dr. James. Um, I want to move to a chapter here, chapter 14. And I don't think either of us could um, be forgiven for not including this chapter because it's organic chemistry background. And um, so chapter 14, everybody, revelation through organic chemistry. And of course, Dr. James is an organic chemist. So we had to include this one. And this apart from, you know, this I mean, being an organic chemist is um, a very substantial part of your life, as well as being a former politician in the uh, US system. And of course, you know, your wife, Dottie, your, your kids and your grandchildren are all very important. But being an organic chemist it forms a very important essence of your life, the private part of your life, not the public part. And here you inform the reader about protein, chlorophyll, hemoglobin, hematology, hydrogen bonding, molecular asymmetry, RNA, DNA, right-handed DNA, or life with a twist. My question is, where does the context of this subject matter you touch upon here relate to a spiritual concept? And do you think that those that you have in mind as your target market, i.e. the educated non-scientist person, will they see the significance of this chapter in the grand scheme of things that you're trying to get across here? Here again, starting with first principles, the organic compounds that organic chemists study or organic chemicals, molecules, are the essence of life. They are a series of compounds, <clears throat> all of which contain carbon. And so organic chemistry is the chemistry of carbon compounds. Now, there are millions of different kinds in your body, and most of them are carbon compounds. They are complex, and therefore, you are complex. Uh, one of the things about carbon is the way in which it attaches other elements, hydrogen, nitrogen, oxygen, chlorine, sulfur, whatever it might be, phosphorus, is such that they are displayed in space in a way that, like your right and left hands, can be mirror images of each other, that are not superimposable. Uh, if you have your palms down, your thumbs are going the wrong way. If your thumbs are together, the palms are facing. They're not superimposable. And yet, while in the laboratory, anytime we synthesize one of these compounds, we get both together because there's no reason in the laboratory for, to favor one or the other. In nature, each of these organic compounds in your body and mine is either right-handed or left-handed, but not both. When I learned that in the, the graduate school, it astounded me. How could that be? What made that selection? Well, we know the, the, the relationship between DNA and RNA and proteins and sugars form that relationship and make that complexity. And so here's the, the closing argument. What organic chemistry <clears throat> enables us to do is to know and understand the structure 
of DNA and RNA and all of these proteins, some 23,000 different proteins in every cell of your body, and somehow coded so that they only do what's needed at the precise location where they are in your body. They don't have to do what some other protein is doing somewhere else. But this, to, to me, is the absolute proof of evolution. Others have tried to say, well, you know, there's this argument, there's that argument. No, this is experimental absolute proof. Darwin could not test his hypothesis. He was just observing this mixture of kinds of species. Now, and he didn't know what caused the variation. Now we know it's a, a, an error in that code within the very complex DNA coding system, an error that leads to a new variety, a variant. And if that variant is favored to survive in nature better than the predecessor, it takes precedence. It, it begins to outnumber. It grows and it becomes the next stage. Knowledge of DNA is confirming proof of evolution. Ah, and so the atheist should rejoice. See, I told you all along, uh, evolution is there. And I say, yes, but wait. DNA is so enormously complicated. That code is so complex, it could not happen by itself. Where did that code from? It didn't come from RNA. It had to be in DNA. RNA gets the code from DNA. How did that sugar in the backbone of DNA get there if there were no proteins to synthesize the sugar? How would you get proteins if there were no RNA? In other words, knowledge of this very complex part of organic chemistry and molecular biology, yes, is, I would say, as absolute proof of evolution as anything that we know in science. And yet, it is so complicated, it is so unlikely to have been self-assembled by some living mm -hmm. cell that it leads me and many others to say there are theological implications here. And again, you have to decide which leap of faith you're going to take on one side or the other. Absolutely. Organic chemistry. Yeah. And no one else had written about it. No, so I did. I, yeah. And of course, Charles Darwin, he observed, you know, the, um, the species, the finches, didn't he? Yep. Yep. I learned that. I have seen Ooh. them. I, we've been to, to the Galapagos with our family, hiked around, saw the turtle, the tortoises. I bet you enjoyed that. Absolutely. I thought you were. Just moving. Um, Dr. James, let's take the audience to one of the chapters in part four of your book, chapter 17. This is the last part of the book, everybody. Are we alone? That is the title. You break the contents of this chapter down to areas like who's on Mars, searching for extraterrestrial intelligence, suitable planets, probability of life elsewhere, Drake's formula. You open the chapter with a quote from Arthur C. Clarke. The quote is, two possibilities exist. Either we are alone in the universe or we are not. Both are equally terrifying. For me, extraterrestrial intelligence and Drake's formula grabbed my attention and I have to say, like in most chapters of the book, the little metaphorical illustrations are interesting to say the least. So are the more meaningful, serious images you have dotted around the book in support of your messages. And we've already covered this off, everybody. These are the little drawings done by his elder son. My question is, do you personally think we are alone? And do you think that this chapter will capture the imagination of the reader with respect to the overall ideology of your book? Are we alone? That's the question. What do you think? 
Is it permissible to say I don't know? It is but absolutely I do permissible. I do, I do think. I, I think that it is not likely that we are going to discover life, but I'll get back to that in a moment. There's a great search looking for it, first looking to find planets outside of our solar system that might be near a star that's just the right temperature and or the right distance and so forth. Uh, that's called the Goldilocks zone, where it's not too hot, not too cold. Do you know that little uh, adage? I don't. I don't. Not, not, well, not too close, not too far, not too large, not too small. If they're too large, they're covered by water. And if there's life there, it would not be able to have technology. If it's too small, it wouldn't have tectonic plate crunching to mix up the minerals so that life could get going. So it has to be just the right size, the right distance from the right start. And, and that's where uh, Drake comes in. He says the likelihood depends on a, a few factors. And if we can find out some of these, we'll get closer to the answer. First, how many, what is the number of suitable stars that aren't too hot, aren't too cold? A supernova is too late. <laughs> Next, you multiply that by the average number of planets around a single star. So we're looking to see how many planets we can find in our uh, galaxy. And we're only looking at a very small dot <laughs> Of, of space in our galaxy because of pointing going 25,000 uh, because that would take going beyond uh, 1250 light years because that's 100 years for a round trip to communicate with them. So we're limited to about 1200 light years. That's 100 human generations, long enough. Uh, and so that's where we're looking. How, we have already discovered some 5,000 planets just in that area, and about 12 of them are about the right size. So we can extrapolate that to the universe and get some idea. So these are large numbers, the number of suitable stars and the number of planets, suitable planets. Uh, next, you multiply that by the probability of abiogenesis on a star. Now you got a very small number. <laughs> Well, it's not a large probability, it's a okay. small probability. And then you multiply it further by the probability of life having grown to get uh, technology that could communicate, intelligent technology. One thing that has to happen is that the brain has to expand on a certain uh, family of uh, species like it happened with humans and our ancestry, the, the Homo sapiens and ancestry, which started about four million years ago, that our brain began to grow because there was a defect, according to Francis Collins, a defect in the gene, in, in the, uh, uh, the proteins that control the chewing muscle. And so the chewing muscle got weaker and the brain expanded. Well, that's happened once in 100 million species known from the fossil and present day record. How likely is that on another planet? Okay, another small number. And then finally, if there were another civilization that was uh, highly sophisticated technologically, are they still there? Would their civilization overlap ours, or were they 100 million years ago? Uh, we don't know. We don't know. Now, the, the final conclusion is, if we ever discover life on another planet or a moon of Jupiter or wherever, it will be the most profound development in the history of science. Even if it's just a single cell uh, molecule, by, uh, you know, just, just a small microbe, if it's living, wow. Then what does that say to us? The atheist would say, see, I told you, we don't need a God. The theist would say, 
a God who could produce life on this planet against these enormous odds, these enormous improbabilities of uh, many hundreds of powers, thousands of powers of 10 improbabilities could certainly do the same thing on another planet or moon. So either side will be able to explain that to their satisfaction. So that means we'll continue to deal with it. And that means in the future, people will have to make their own decisions just as you do. I don't tell you what to believe, but I wanted to give you a lot to think about. There you go, everyone. Are we alone? Have a look at that chapter. Um, We're not alone. My wife just came back in. <laughs> <laughs> Dr. James, what's next for you? You know, any more books coming down the line? Well, I'm writing a, a novel about uh, a colonel in the Space Force. And the first chapter is the court martial of that colonel because of his leading an expedition to try to move a giant asteroid, which we know of, known as Apophis, A-P-O-P-H-I-S, to alter its uh, orbit so that it would not strike the Earth in the future. And some of his ideas get him into trouble, and uh, he gets court-martialed, becomes science advisor of the governor of North Carolina. Oh, I wonder where that and, theory came from. <laughs> and, and lives on a lake on the beaten path with a group of neighbors who like to talk about religion and politics and not shout at each other, not get mad at each other for discussing controversies on which they disagree. There you uh, go, everybody. So I, I think it has so many potential because in this day and age, it well, thanks to social media, people have gotten off into different silos and they don't listen to each other. They don't have to listen to each other. They can get it all fed to them by artificial intelligence, repeating to them just what they want to hear. That's that's a tragedy. So I think this novel will will use some of the scientific material from the uh, revelation through science in order to illustrate some of the arguments that you can get into. Well, I hope I, you'll find it fascinating. And I hope I get to interview about it. Um, if I can get a publisher. And uh, Dr. James, where can people get your books from? Well, you can get the book from Amazon, of course, on the internet, or from my publisher, X-L-I-B-R-I-S, X Libris, uh, Barnes & Noble, uh, bookstores available. Uh, or you can could get it on my website, uh, www.beatenpathbooks.com. Um, because it'll tell you how to get it. And you'll see some interesting summaries. Of, in fact, you can read all of the reviews that have been written about my book. The first yeah. edition, there were a couple of criticisms that I thought were fair, and that's why you get critics to read. But interestingly, the most recent, the revised edition, has seven reviews with not one negative word. Uh, try to find that in a book of this type. And it's already won 11 awards, first place awards for science, technology, uh, for religion, for Christianity, for philosophy, for wild card. And uh, for the year 2022 was ranked the third best nonfiction book in the United States. So it might be worth seeing what's going on here. I know. Uh, and... Do you know, you, you, stole, you stole my line there because I was just going to read out all the awards, but you've done it for me. Anyway, never mind. And as it says, go onto his web. We think a lot, John. <laughs> go onto his web page and see why his web page is called Beaten Paths. I'm not answering that. Um, Dr. James, it's been a huge pleasure and a sheer delight interviewing you and looking at your book. Dr. James G. Martin, everybody and his book, right. Revelation Through Science. Thanks for hosting me. This has been a delightful exercise for me, getting to become acquainted with you, your personality, your your own personal charm, the way in which, you know, I have to flatter you a little bit because the saying is in politics, <laughs> flattery will get you pretty much whatever you want. 
right? <laughs> oh, absolutely. Flattery gets you everywhere. <laughs> I think flattery right. gets you everywhere. Whatever, everybody, yes. whatever you need. Well, thank absolutely. you for hosting this. Um, I'm J.D. Crowley. Thanks for listening, watching, wherever you are in the world. Stay safe. Until next time.